over again at the end, there are no questions. So I hope we won't have that problem. Um, and know that I am already sweating, so that's not because of the grilling, that's just because of the, the space. So don't feel bad about that either. So uh, I'm from the company called uh, MetaWave. So just to give you sort of an introduction for who we are and, and, and how long we've been around. So we were founded in early 2017. Um, so we're about to finish our uh, Series A funding round. Uh, we were spun out of the Xerox Park facility in um, Palo Alto, and we now are spread across two locations. So most of the hardware development happens now in Southern California, Carl is that. Um, so we've been really grateful. You know, the, the very first round of funding was a lot of venture capital, seed funding. Uh, but since then, we've had tremendous interest from uh, industry <coughs> partners, so people across the automotive value chain from um, tier ones, tier twos. Uh, and let me tell you, once you've been through both Japanese and German due diligence, fundraising gets a whole <laughs> lot easier. <laughs> People say, oh, these guys aren't just a, a PowerPoint presentation anymore. Um, so the primary focus of what we do, what 85% of our engineering resources is focused on, is a high-resolution, long-range automotive radar. So I'm going to talk about that primarily today. That's the, the most exciting thing, the high upside play, the, uh, yeah, the thing that, uh, that I work most on. Um, and specifically within that, we want to build not just the hardware like nobody else has, but the full perception solution behind that. And so that's where the artificial intelligence engine, which we brand AWARE, comes in to say, we can actually interpret this radar signal, not just hand off raw data, because most end users aren't radar experts, and instead say, here is a pedestrian, here is a car with a high degree of safety. <coughs> so the other two areas that we play in that this technology dovetails nicely with is 5G and fixed wireless networks. So uh, a lot of times when you when you give a presentation like this and you say we're a small startup, we're less than 50 people, less than two years old, and we're trying to tackle automotive radar and 5G, they'll say that's too much. You're going to burn yourself out. You're going to run out of steam. So part of the argument that I'd like to convince you of is that actually the engineering overlap between these two things is such that we're able to tackle both of these markets with fundamentally the same technology. And so that turns into a strength rather than a detriment. OK, mm -hmm. so what is the role of the sensor that we're trying to create? So virtually every fully autonomous vehicle that's on the roads today, uh, in testing, of course, uh, uses the same basic set of sensors. You've got cameras, LIDAR, radar, uh, <coughs> usually a GPS, IMU. Um, and, and that works pretty well under nice conditions where you know where you're driving, weather's not too bad, sun is shining. Uh, but there's an issue if you say, I want to drive really fast, so I need to see further than 100 meters, 150 meters, what your, your LiDAR can give you. There's an issue when you say, well, when the sun goes down, my camera optics are really good, but they can really only see as far as my headlights. Um, there's an issue when you say, I want to drive in bad weather conditions where my LiDAR is going to fail, because at 905, you're going to get horrible attenuation through fog. If it's at 1550, it's not going to see wet objects very well. And so there's this big missing hole in there. And, and the sort of subtext to all of this is a lot of these sensors are incredibly expensive. You know, you, you're lucky if you can get a high-performance LiDAR for less than a few tens of thousands of dollars. So mm -hmm. the sensor that we're trying to build addresses all of these issues and comes that we're targeting under a $500 price point. So it's, it's fundamentally radar, but it's done in a absolutely novel way. So just to give you an overview, I don't expect that you all are experts on the existing <coughs> radar landscape. But broadly speaking, the, the two um, dominant approaches today are digital beamforming and massive MIMO radar. Um, in both of those cases, you rely on having a large number of transmitters and receivers. Um, so you're transmitting a whole bunch of different waveforms. And you're doing complex digital signal processing to try and analyze those echoes and figure out what is actually out there in the scene. MetaWave's approach is fundamentally different. We can use as few as one transmit and one receive port. And what we do is use a custom analog front end to form a beam to concentrate all of that radar energy into this narrow beam and actually scan the scene. So this is something closer to what LiDAR does. You actually can do a raster scan to develop an image <coughs> of the scene. And this has a number of advantages, as I'll, uh, as I'll demonstrate. One of the big ones uh, is actually range and signal to noise ratio. So if you're limited by regulations of the total amount of power that you can transmit, you can see much, much further and pierce cloud much more effectively if you squeeze all that energy into a narrow beam. And additionally, you get much better angular resolution. Uh, a lot of times radar companies will talk about 
angular resolution they kind of try and sweep under the rug the issue of angular separation. They'll say, oh yeah, we've got one degree angular resolution. What they mean is that if you've got a corner reflector, something designed to reflect radar waves, you can sort of put it out in the field by itself and know exactly the angle to it really precisely. But if you have two of those points <coughs> next to each other, they say, oh, that's just, that's just one object. Or if you have a pedestrian changing a tire on a road, they say, well, we can see the car, we can't really distinguish that there's a pedestrian next to it. And so that's why in a lot of these autonomous applications, the radar is relegated to kind of a verification, <coughs> an early warning system, uh, adaptive cruise control, and the heavy perception load is handed off to the camera and LiDAR. So does it, it, you're allowed to emit a certain amount of energy, right? Mm -hmm. And today it's emitted at 60 degrees or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and I, radar gets pretty warm when you're standing in front of it. It's emitting a lot of energy. So you're concentrating it. Is there a safety issue with that beam if I'm standing right next to it? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, especially when you say, you know, we've got these you know, high frequency and you throw on with like metastructure, you know, things can, can look pretty scary. Um, the, the actual powers in terms of like biological safety are negligible. Uh, and, you know, what you really worry about, you know, the, the two main things to worry about with, with radiation are, one is eye safety. Um, in this case, it's much too long wavelength, it's about three and a half millimeters at 77 megahertz, so there's no concerns there like you would get with an IO5 LiDAR. And the other would be ionizing radiation. So like gamma rays cause cancer because they break apart DNA strands and they mutate. Uh, and there's nowhere near that energy. So basically the only thing that it can do to hurt you is to heat you up and it doesn't do that in any sort of physical way. Matt, can you do a, an arbitrary scan so you can dwell on a region of interest, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, a really good question. That's actually one of the unique capabilities of the sensor and particularly from an AI standpoint, it opens up exciting new options because um, the, the rate limiting step for, for instance, scanning a scene is the dwell time in each orientation. So we can change the direction <coughs> of the beam on the order of microseconds. So there's a tremendous advantage to be gained if you have an algorithm which says, okay, I did sort of a rough scan and it looks like there's something interesting over there. Let me look at it more finely. Yes? Speaking of one for And do you know what the, the frequency is? They are talking about the VMA. Uh, talking about what? VMA. <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, cause we did some actually some calculations on this because we were, you know, wondering about this. And so the, the penetration depth for, for this frequency is on the order of like a millimeter and a half or something like that. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I personally haven't seen any evidence that, that you know, suggests that this is uh, a harmful thing, and particularly since this is the, the frequency and the power that's allocated for these radars. Um, you know, I, yeah, I don't, I don't anticipate any, uh, anything like that. Um, okay, so, so one, of the, one of the things which is really exciting about uh, <coughs> developing a new piece of hardware like this is that actually it becomes the ideal test bed for deep learning. <coughs> so, so there's a tremendous amount of development on camera images and deep learning. Uh, LiDAR is catching up, there's some really nice results out there. Uh, but if you look for the combination of deep learning and radar, it's practically a null set in the literature. And part of the reason for that is that a lot of these off-the-shelf radars that you get will spit out sort of a very sparse point cloud. They'll say, there's some object over there and it has this approximate brightness. There's not much that you can do with that from a machine learning standpoint. But if you're getting a rich, high-dimensional uh, representation of your environment, it's the perfect application to apply deep learning to, to do these higher level classifications. So I promise I'll talk more about what this image means later on. But the, the question that I mainly want to address is deep learning requires lots and lots of data. And there aren't any publicly available radar data sets. And even if there were of, of any consequence, even if there were, they wouldn't be suitable for our application because nobody's out there collecting data with a sensor like ours. So how do you as a small startup say that you are going to have deep learning built into what you're doing if you can't leverage these large data sets. So the question is, what do you do? So in our case, the solution was we were going to collect our own data. So the idea is, let's get the highest performance sensor suite <coughs> and perception software that we can build behind it so that we can drive around with our sensor and these other, uh, this other sensor fusion system, use the sensor fusion system to generate ground truth labels and use that to train our radar-based algorithm. So this is a shot of our uh, test vehicle down in Carlsbad. So uh, the principal elements, we have actually two 
generations of our radar. So this is the, um, the very first prototype that we mounted on the vehicle. Um, this is a, a subsequent one. You can see the, the packaging improves as we integrate more and more things. Um, the other two features up here are a Velodyne LiDAR and a Blackmore LiDAR. So uh, we bought this Blackmore LiDAR maybe four months ago. I was very pleased with the performance and all that. And subsequently they were purchased by Aurora. <laughs> so, oh, okay. That's good. That's just to make sure everyone's still paying attention. <laughs> um, so I've told, especially our interns, in no uncertain terms that they are to uh, handle this with kid gloves because we're not going to be able to get another one. <laughs> Um, so, in this case, we can actually leverage um, some features of our radar relative to these other sensors uh, to our great benefit. So, one thing, as I mentioned, LiDAR and camera have issues at night and in the rain and in the fog, whereas a radar principally doesn't. So, in fact, if you capture radar data under these conditions, at night it makes absolutely no difference. In heavy fog, it makes practically no difference. So, what we can do is actually drive around with the sensor suite when it's sunny, um, when it's clear skies, generate this training data, and then the radar algorithm that we produce will be able to function exactly as well, or nearly exactly as well, under these inclement weather conditions. We also have some advantages relative to other, uh, for instance, self-driving companies that are trying to solve this perception problem, and that we don't need to do this processing online. We're trying to collect all of the data in real time, make sure it's all timestamped, synchronized, and all of that, but we don't need to say down to the 100 millisecond level exactly where things are all at once. So we can do things like propagating trackers backwards in time to develop higher quality predictions. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a block diagram. This would be qualitatively similar to, to a lot of these. Um, one of the things that I'd really like to highlight, and that actually goes to, to your question, is actually we have the capacity to have a feedback between the AI engine and the sensor itself. So this is one of the things that we're uh, most excited about. And if I'm honest, we'll prove one of the most challenging <laughs> okay. I was about to say one of the most challenging, and I think it, it took that as a personal affront. Um, one of the most challenging things to, uh, to, to verify, but um, one of the biggest uh, opportunities for improvement and uniqueness from an algorithm standpoint. All right. So just to give you a sense of, of what this system is capable of, this is actually down on uh, uh, foothills. We took this image from a car. This is not how low our test vehicle is. Um, but just to give you a sense, you know, we've got this, this line of cars. Uh, we measured actually the distance to that cyclist is about 350 meters, um, and similarly for that, that road sign out there. Uh, so we're able to use publicly available and um, open source licensed uh, segmentation algorithms. So we don't have to train these from scratch. We can benefit from the work of the community to actually drive our perception system. So in this case, we're able to uh, detect these things down to the pixel level uh, at really long distances. So in this case, we use physical optics and we use uh, fixed focal length, and we focus on objects, particularly which are in the 200 to 300 meter range, because those are the ones that are that we're most interested in, in seeing that our radar detecting would add the most value to. Um, so the other the other sort of centerpiece to this, as I mentioned, is the Blackmore lidar. So unlike traditional lidar, um, it is uh, FMCW based. It operates at 1550 nanometers, um, and what that means is that it actually measures the velocity of everything that it sees. So we can use this to label for radar data, which is also measuring range and velocity, in a highly precise way. That also means that we can segment interesting things from our scene almost for free. We don't need to run this through any sort of deep learning based classifier. We can... <laughs> I would cut that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to make this better or a lot worse. Okay. Oh. <laughs> That's good. We have a little bit of excitement, you know. <laughs> and I think all we're missing is a power outage, and then we'll be uh, <laughs> really underway. Um, right. So, so in this case, we can actually drive these 3D bounding boxes. So you can see here, um, you know, a camera detection-based algorithm would say, well, there's a whole bunch of stacked boxes. You can't really distinguish things. Um, if we switch actually to the bird's eye view representation, we can actually see these are um, valid boxes. They're detecting objects which are out in the 200, even 300 meter range. Um, in this case, the boxes are represented with uh, uncertainties which are algorithmically generated. So when I showed one of our engineers this Blackmore LiDAR, he looked at that and he said, why, why are we making a sensor then if they can do all of these things? So um, rest assured, this, this Blackmore LiDAR, although I'm very pleased with the performance, 
you know, it takes up about this much space, consumes, you know, a ton of power, costs about $40,000, and doesn't really work in the rain. So, <laughs> although I'm very happy with, with these aspects of it, I'm also not, uh, not particularly threatened by it from a business standpoint. Um, so, what you can do with this is to um, have these high precision. Again, we're, we're fusing the bird's eye view here, so the van is located on the far left, um, with the, uh, the camera view. So, we use the perception from these cameras, again, this, this open source segmentation algorithm, and then we extract all of the moving objects and their sizes from this FMCW LiDAR data. And we are able to, as a small team <laughs> with, I don't know, $60,000 of budget, um, construct this automatic labeling system which allows us to train our algorithm. So in about two minutes of data collection, we can we can surpass what we were able to do with thousands of dollars of human annotation, which, which we used uh, in the past. And furthermore, human annotations don't work particularly well on a task like this because we need the velocity of the object, which looking at a camera feed is pretty difficult to determine. And you also need the objects which are out uh, out at hundreds of meters away, which even with a high resolution camera is difficult for human annotators to be reliable. So um, even when we had those resources, or even when we were investing resources in that, uh, the results were, were fairly unreliable. So now we can algorithmically generate these labels and use them to drive our perception engine towards the radar. Um, so this is just one of my really, really <laughs> fun results. You know, the first time I, I fired the system up on this data, um, I, I saw this, this box. <laughs> The very first time was exciting, then I had to add a system to say, okay, now when you see birds, don't, don't report <laughs> them. <laughs> so, uh, but it's still one of my favorite uh, so, so this slide, I'll, I'll play this video again, because this, I think, will take some explanation. This is a, uh, the natural representation of radar data. So this is what's called a range Doppler plot. In this case, the horizontal axis is range, the vertical axis is velocity, <laughs> um, and the black is the shared <laughs> Um So. The, uh, the heat map here represents the radar return. So these are all fixed objects because they're <coughs> from zero. And these would be cars which are moving away from the sensor. Now the red points and the red boxes represent the detection. The, the red points are the raw FMCW LiDAR points. And the red boxes are the detection output by the system. So this is just an example of the labels <coughs> generated by the system where we can use this to then feed say, something like an object detection network on radar data like this. Uh, so this is something that would have taken a very long time with human annotators before. And, and you always collect that data from a fixed position? Um, for generating the very first PowerPoint slides, yes, we did. Um, <laughs> going forward, we, uh, no, we're of course, you know, as an automotive radar, you need to be able to just watch it yeah. when it's moving. Um, so yeah, so this radar was collected with a, a, a fixed beam, and so this was uh, about a three-degree angular resolution. So the model that we're delivering to OEMs at the end of this month, um, well, end of next month, I suppose, um, uh, has a, about a 1.8-degree resolution. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So in this case, we're we're steering in, in azimuth only, and the field of view is about uh, six degrees per second. Yeah. So we, we sort of go in in stages. So yes, we can do the azimuth beam steering, and then you have the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, jamming is a, is a, a that's a good question. Um, so there are a number of things that you can do just from a general radar standpoint. Um, so you can do things like hopping frequency bands if you detect jamming. You can use uh, custom modulation encoding to sort of prevent people from, from doing this antagonistic attack. But actually the best defense that our radar has against that is the fact that we're only transmitting and we're only looking in one particular direction at any given time. Exactly. Yeah. So in order to jam, you need to be coming from exactly where I'm looking at that time. Is there any material that will either not reflect or absorb that energy? Yeah. Sure. I mean, you can you can have things which are absorptive to, um, to radar. Most so of probably not on your car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can. So you know, for instance, we have like an anechoic chamber which looks um, sort of qualitatively like a sonic anechoic mm -hmm. chamber. You know, you take foam and, and cut yeah, binders. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but you have to worry not only about uh, malicious jamming, but um, congestion from other similar radars. You know, yeah. You distinguish one from the other by the band, I guess, it's in, or some pulse code. 
Yeah, exactly. So, so I mean, that's, I, that's the principal reason for the FCC limitation on the, the transmit power. Um, and again, you know, because you're only transmitting and looking in one location, that's, that's mitigated a fair amount. Um, there's also the point that um, because of the way that FMCW works, uh, basically you're it's sort of like in, interferometry. So you send a particular signal and then interfere it with your own signal. So even if you had two of these radars facing each other, the effect would be to raise the noise floor, but not to give you like ghost targets that you might be able to light up. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's that's one representation of the input data. Yeah. So that that would be sort of your your starting point. So one of the things there's not a um, there's not any object in this video other than cars. But one of the things that um, you can use, so a skilled annotator can look at radar data like this and distinguish a pedestrian from a car. And one of the things that you can, well, two of the things that you can look for. One is sort of the velocity characteristic. Um, you know, people don't tend to move at 15 meters per second. Um, they don't tend to be this reflective when you're out at 200 meters. And so if you see something bright and fast, almost certainly that's that's a car. So so those are two strong indicators. But the one that can actually really distinguish it from maybe a, a car which is partially occluded or moving slowly is this multi-component movement. So you see here these um, these blobs. They tend to be sort of oval shaped, and that comes from the, the interferometry processing sort of uncertainty that you get from doing the FST. But if you look at a pedestrian, you have not just the center of mass motion, but also the swimming lines. And the same effect happens on uh, cyclists as well. And so you'll actually see this sort of flicker of things moving slightly faster and slightly slower than the main <coughs> motion. And the frequency at which this flicker happens can give you a lot of clues as to the type of object that you're looking at. So this is the sort of <coughs> signal that you just don't get with these other sensing modalities. Um, and so even though we don't have the, the resolution of like a LIDAR, we can have a perception capability at the full range of our senses. And I have uh, some, some slides coming up on that. So um, just to sort of give an overview of this, this perception network, um, we have sort of a number of, of different elements. The, the sort of centerpiece of this, though, is this um, Kalman filter, which uses the data from these different sensor streams. Um, another thing that we're able to do is we're using a combination of GPS and Veldheim data. Because we don't need to do online processing, we can essentially construct a map mm -hmm. of everywhere that we drive. And that serves two purposes. So one is that if you've constructed a map, then you know really precisely exactly the motion that you underwent. So when you're then trying to track objects in the world, you know exactly how to compensate them for the motion of the ego vehicle. And you can do this much more precisely than just the raw GPS IME data would give you. The other is to say, if I know, if I have a really detailed map of the street 300 meters in front of me because I'm about to have driven there, then I can use that for super resolution tasks for the radar. So I can say, ah, I know what the right answer is for all the static objects in the scene because 10 seconds from now when I drive past them, I've constructed this map of them. And so, again, <coughs> we're able to use a little bit of, of smarts with these sensors and really maximize the array that we're able to create. And the last thing that I'll say on this slide is that actually we have the capability of using the radar and our deep neural networks themselves to bootstrap and actually gain information. So, imagine in a, a first sample we have no radar network whatsoever. We just use camera, LIDAR, and our other LIDAR to drive our best guess as to what the external world is. Then we use that to train the first generation of our radar network. Then we <coughs> drop that in here and we say, cool, let's see if we can increase the estimates of the states of the objects in our state. And we're going to compare this against a small sample of human annotated data so we know what the right answer is. That allows us to calibrate the uncertainty that we should take the outputs of this network with. And so even if they're really inaccurate to start, they still add something to our estimate of the state. And so we're able to iterate this procedure between training and generating labels and actually gain information in a novel way. <laughs> okay, so one of the unfortunate things about being a startup, which is actually in the phase of making things, is that the results that you're allowed to share by your CEO are about six months old. <laughs> so this is what we did at um, CES this year. So in this case, we had just our Velodyne LiDAR and the uh, older of the radars that you saw on the, the test vehicle. So in this case, uh, the objective was to demonstrate that we actually can have these deep learning networks uh, deployed in real time to drive perception. Uh, so on our left, we have the blue points representing the, the Velodyne. This orange cone represents the field of view of the radar. And these little uh, white ticks represent the uh, 
uh, depicted object. So in this case, again, we have our Raine's Doppler plot. In this case, Raine's is on the vertical axis, uh, velocity is on the horizontal axis. Um, so to give an insight into what the network is actually outputting, you can see here the segmentation performed by the camera. So again, this is our, our input data. And in this case, you can see, perhaps if you squint, um, this sort of spreading in the velocity direction that I was talking about. This is really characteristic of a, of a pedestrian walking away with, with three arms. And in this case, the network was able to pick up on that motion, and you see in the pedestrian column, that region of the image is segmented perfectly, while these other cars are segmented as well. So the other interesting thing about this <coughs> is that it's not just about doing classification. But it's actually about surpassing the performance of these traditional radar signal processing algorithms. So radar, of course, has been around for many decades, and there's books and books written on how to maximally extract signals if you have a radar which is pointed at the sky and trying to pick out an air airplane. But for these complicated schemes, or when you're trying to do classification or picking things out of dense environments, they they don't function as well as you might think. So in this case, you know, I've looked at a lot of these range software plots. I don't see a car there. But if you look at the video from which the screenshot was taken, there is in fact, that, that is the right answer. There is a car there coming into view. So in this case, by observing the signal over time, it was able to pick up on something which existed below the noise floor and would have been missed by traditional signal processing algorithms. Additionally, this network was trained on human annotated data. And having reviewed every single data point of uh, <laughs> that whole data set, I'm, I'm, I feel confident in saying there was no human annotator that that would label something like that. And so it's actually able to extend beyond that and surpass the performance of the human annotator. Have you ever seen recovery from the signal? How fast can we recover? Um, I mean, so <laughs> basically every every time that we get a new uh, map, the, the network outputs the new prediction. And so you know, in principle, we can you know we can have a false alarm and then recover from it um, within one frame. And, and if you observe something like a motorcyclist who had his arms off his bike and moving them, would it be seen as a pedestrian? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the classification is as perfect, of course. Um, so, <laughs> this is a, a, a slight uh, diversion of an anecdote. When I was first getting into machine learning, I trained, the, you know, I would train these, these image classifiers, as everybody does, and I would show them, like, I'd say, look, uh, you know, give me a, give me a picture of a dog, and it'll tell it apart from a cat. And all they would ever send me is pictures of dogs in cat costumes or <laughs> cats that kind of look like dogs. <laughs> you know, so that's that's what people always go for. They say, well, what if it's kind of in between? And yeah. you know, we haven't specifically selected for examples of, of things which might be on the boundary. Um, <laughs> mostly in, the, in our case, because we're a long-range sensor, it's about mm -hmm. early detection. And so yep. if you say, okay, this is a car or maybe a pedestrian, we're not quite sure. It's something. It's something. In, 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 in the final product, would you, you see yourself as an exclusively radar company, or would you seek to leverage the fusion techniques you use to put a camera in there, use the existing camera system? Yeah, so I think we, we see the, the fusion as, we, we leverage it to, um, to deploy um, our, our other products. We actually see later on in the presentation, we can use that same software which is used to collect that data on the 5G side as well. Oh, cool. Um, you know, I think I think probably in terms of selling a sensor fusion system, mm -hmm. that's not where we see ourselves. I think <coughs> the closest we would come is to say, hey, here's a module which has a radar and a camera, um, and it has a perception system built in the mind. So, do you think you could replace LiDAR? Everyone always asks that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there are some things that LiDAR is always going to be better at. You know, so I think for, like, warehouse robotics, you know, I think a solid-state LiDAR is going to be your best bet. Um, I think if you want to have if you want to ship two million vehicles to personal owners, mm -hmm. uh, I think you're going to need to find a way to do that without LiDAR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> but you get multi-pass problems indoors? With radar? In principle, you can, yeah. Yeah, so it actually can be a strength on the road, um, in particular for imaging the car in front of the car in front of you, because mm -hmm. um, you get a pretty clear signal from reflecting off the pavement uh, to the car in front of you. And so that can provide a nice early warning system. Mm -hmm. Even actually existing adaptive cruise controls will sometimes trigger alarms based on that, mm -hmm. um, just because they can't. 
they can't filter out that signal and so they, they use it anyway. Alright, cool. Thank you for the question. Um, so, so the last thing, just to reiterate a point that I made earlier, um, because the, the velocity information, the sort of other stream of information is available to the sensor, even if the resolution isn't as high as some of these other sensors, we can do perception at the full range, which in this case, for this demonstration, is 350 meters. And so if you look at something like a VLP-16, which granted is not the top of the line, but um, costs about six to $7,000, uh, you can see, you know, they'll say our range is about 100 meters, and that, that's about right. But at 100 meters, you get a point or two. Um, and so if you really want to talk about your actual classification range, you're looking where you can resolve type information. For us, all we, all we need to be able to do is get some return from this thing, and then we can use that velocity information to do a preliminary classification. So we see this as a tremendous advantage to our sensor and sort of an underutilized uh, aspect of radar generally. Okay, so the first part of this talk I focused on the sort of landscape of sensors. So if you look at, you know, range versus resolution, uh, you say, okay, today's radar has pretty good range, better than, than LiDAR and camera for the most part, uh, but the resolution is absolutely poor. And so what we're aiming to do is to develop technology which has comparable resolution to these other uh, modalities, but greatly extends the range. And again, to do this at a cost point which is competitive with existing radars, not existing LIDAR. So the second half of, of what I'd like to talk about focuses on the problem with 5G deployment. So uh, 4G is, you know, of course, successful and wide use. Um, it's, it's fantastic. The issue with it is that we want to go to higher bandwidth and lower latency. In order to accommodate that, we need to move to higher frequencies. We say, cool, 5G is going to be at 28 gigahertz that can absolutely meet the bandwidth and latency requirements that we want. The big problem is when we move to these higher frequencies, now attenuation, path loss, becomes a huge problem. And so you can't just take everywhere that you had a 4G base station and put a 5G base station and have a successful enterprise. So the range of these things, the coverage, goes way, way down. So the, uh, the sort of class of products that, that Medwave is seeking to offer in this, uh, in this market addresses that issue of how do you actually deploy the 5G, how do you get to these long ranges. Uh, and the fundamental technology underpinning it is the beam shaping and steering technology that we use for the radar. Um, so I'm going to show a video here, parts of which will probably get blacked out. Um, so we'll mm -hmm. just sort of watch this and then I'll talk about uh, some of the things that, that it shows. There is audio with this video, but I'm actually grateful that it's not playing because it's like really intense music and... <laughs> <laughs> What's a demo video or something? I, well, yeah, no, I know. The, the, our first CTO really liked it, but it makes us look super evil, so... It's, it's <laughs> silent. Especially that beam going right through. Yeah, I know. It's like, wah. <laughs> <laughs> I promise we're not evil. Are you going simultaneous with the MIMO or you do PDM? Uh, so in this case, we call this uh, spatial multiplexing. So, so the idea is it's... Yeah. So, so rather than having a you know, broad beam that sort of covers all of these users and then trying to do temporal multiplexing or these other, um, these other communication strategies to try and get all of the users onto the same uh, spectrum, you say instead you can have this beam shaping and steering technology having separate connections to separate users. So now you can do all of that multiplexing for each of those things and in addition have separate spatial channels depending on where these things are. Okay. Steering a single beam and spending part of the time on this part target and another part of the time on another target? You could do it that way or you could also have multiple beams. Multiple time beams. Yeah. How does it track the target? Yeah, so so in that case you say basically you can go by the, the return intent. You can say, okay, I'm gonna steer a little bit and mm -hmm. say, you know, okay, I got a little bit less signal when I steer like this and uh, Okay, there's a there's a feedback. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you, you can also say, okay, if you're connecting to a phone, well it's because the bandwidth is so high you can send over GPS packets and not have So um, another thing which is, I think, even more exciting is the solution to the, the shadow breaking. So this is this is a problem some with 4G, some with Wi-Fi, but it becomes an incredible problem with 5G. As, you, as I mentioned, the penetration depths are absolutely poor. I mean, that's how we're able to use, I mean, that 28 gigahertz to 720 gigahertz for radar because when you shine it at something, mostly it reflects back to you. Um, so the idea here is to actually have uh, these passive reflector rays. So you can think about these like a smart mirror. 
So imagine you have this, this panel. Um, you say, I've designed it to come for uh, incident light from a particular angle and reflect it in a particular way. And when I say a particular way, I mean controlling the beam width, controlling the direction, uh, and getting high gain relative to just a, a passive reflector, which can, of course, only reflect enough. So in this case, the well, it is passive in the sense that there are no electronics, so it's just printed circuit board. Um, the steering happens at the sort of point of, of manufacturing. So it's a you design a you design the reflector for one incident angle and one reflected angle with a particular beam. Um, so in fact, this is uh, not just a PowerPoint slide. We, we tested one of these in uh, Japan, or rather uh, NTC Dokimo um, tested this. And so in this case, they had a uh, uh, an Ericsson base station on top of this building and a metal wave reflector ray mounted on top of this van. You can see another image of it here. Um, and then they tested the downlink speeds in this shadow region. So this would be a super common application. It's like it's easy to mount things up on the top of the building. All of the users are going to be down on the street. And they were actually able to observe an increase in downlink speeds by an order of magnitude mm -hmm. just by having this relatively cheap reflector ray. So if you look at the difference between the value that we provide to Telco and the unit cost for us to manufacture one of these things, the difference is several orders of magnitude. And so for something like 5G, where all of these companies are trying to figure out how are we going to do, do this deployment in a way that makes economical sense, um, this is something which is uh, really exciting. All right. So the other application for this, of course, is to have these uh, reflector rays indoor. So you can imagine trying to uh, propagate 5G into a building. And again, the issue is uh, you know, how do you get around all these little nooks and crannies to actually deliver um, this, this uh, 5G signal? So I mentioned that um, we were reusing some of the sensor fusion code. So in particular, what we're able to do is to take our LiDAR, our GPS IMU, walk around a building like this, create a high precision 3D map of the interior of it, and then use electromagnetic simulations combined with AI to say, here are exactly where you need to place your reflector rays, here's where you need to place your active repeaters in order to maximize performance. So from a business standpoint, this makes just a ton of sense. I mean, one, we have the, the software and hardware already ready for the, the uh, sensor fusion data collection. Also, when you're developing a new product like this, people aren't accustomed to thinking about reflector rays. They won't be able to go onto your website and know which ones they need to order and where to place them. So if you say, we'll tell you which of our products you need to buy, that's a tremendous value add. And any time that you can shoehorn AI into what you're doing, it's a good thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> you get blockchain in there. I know, yeah. That's, that's yeah, the, the auto... auto <laughs> make that joke a lot, too. <laughs> um, so, so just to sort of give a, a, a recap overview, um, so so we're trying to tackle the, the sensor problem in this fundamentally new way. Um, the, the principal innovation is this beam steering technology that we have uh, an exclusive patent for from, from Xerox Park. Um, so this allows us to see much further with higher clarity, and then we're also doing the work to build a perception engine behind that. Uh, so we constructed this high performance sensor fusion system in order to construct these labels automatically. This gives us the data sets that we need to really make the fullest use of the sensor and deploy these uh, object detection and picture resolution networks. At the same time, we're <coughs> leveraging this technology to solve these big problems in 5G, where people say, how are we going to deploy these networks in a way that makes economic sense? So we're able to reuse a lot of our, um, our RFIC technology, our beam steering technology, our diffusion technology, um, and, and apply it to this other area as well, which is a truly massive market. So, uh, thank you very much for the questions, for the attention. I'm going to leave this on our social media slide. Please follow us on Twitter. Hey. Yeah. So, I don't know how much you can talk about it, but I was, could you do a little bit more of a deep dive into how the beam string? Sure. Yeah. So, so the, the basic idea, um, are you familiar with the, the concept of a phase array? Yeah. So, so basically, we're constructing a phase array uh, by using our own analog phase system. And so, um, you know, you can imagine a, a line of such elements that you've just seen in the azimuth. The, the energy splits off in different ways, and then before it gets to its final point of radiation, we say, we're going to adjust your phase just right so that you uh, form a beam in a particular direction. So doing it this way allows us to 
um, for instance, cut down on the high web levels, which are a huge problem for, for Google Bing Formal. So you direct energy just here and not here and also a little bit in this direction and this direction. Um, the phase shifters that we used, initially when the company was founded, we thought, oh, we'll go and buy some of these phase shifters. We tested all of them at 77 gigahertz and none of them had the performance characteristics that we wanted. So we said, okay, we will hire an entire RFIC team and help them spend a year building phase shifters. Uh, they came back with stuff that works better than even things that we can buy at lower frequencies. Um, so we're, uh, we're not selling those. <laughs> We said that's one of those sort of advantages that we've been uh, taking in the process. We also have our own uh, PAs and LNAs um, for power amplifiers and low noise amplifiers um, for, for amplifying the signal, and we designed those to also work at um, other frequency bands so we can reuse those in some of the radio products. So that's how many different that's right, yeah. So, so there are kind of a number of different ways to do that. Um, yeah, so you can think right now in the order of a few, a few tens, you know, um, something like that. But the nice thing about this is unlike the digital approaches where you say if you want to, if you want to make a narrow beam, you have to have much more silicon, you have to cascade more of these transceiver chips. Here, it's just a question of adding a few more of these RFICs, making your package a little bit bigger. Um, that's actually the the packaging size is the main limiting factor, and there we're limited basically by the laws of physics. You know, if you want a narrow beam, you need to make a wider base. Yeah. You see these passive reflectors are essentially replacing a, a series of microcells along the roadway. Yeah, yeah. So the whole the whole idea is to, to say let's let's cut down on the number of the phase stations that we need. So one one of the things that I didn't talk about, we also have a an active version of these, um, which we call the turbo, which basically again it's, it's purely analog. You can think one of our antennas facing this way, another one facing that way. Um, again with our our analog amplifiers. Um, so those. I mean, those, of course, is, a, is an exciting product, but it doesn't, um, you know, it costs a bit more. You need a license to operate that kind of thing. So, um, but that's if you're just talking about straight, wide open fields, that's kind of the way to go. So it's like, <coughs> yeah, so right now we're, we're using different antennas for transmitting the feed. Um, we looked into, you can use modulation schemes, which where you only need a single one. Um, and that's nice from the standpoint of, sort of cutting down on materials and packaging size, but you also give away stuff, you give away something in resolution. Um, and you do it on both. We do it on both. Um, yeah, so, so the, the system that I showed there was, uh, was sort of six beams. So we're just looking in, in one direction. Yeah, but the, the system which will run on the, the hardware that we're delivering this month um, will, will sort of take the combined view and, and do some classifications about that. Yeah? Um, what kind of post processing is there on the output that allows you to do the processing? So, what we've learned, and I can't, I, I can't speak totally thoroughly about it, but actually um, the, the basic principle seems to have held that the less pre-processing that you can do, the better off you're going to be. And then actually the neural network runs best from the as close to raw features as possible. So we do enough processing so that it gets to something like a range Doppler representation, so that spatial locations correspond to a particular range in velocity. There is a less processed version of that, which is just a time series. Um, that is is almost impossible for the, you know, the, the neural network needs to learn sort of windowed FFTs before it can even learn any sort of object detection. And so we, we do that level of processing, but in general we try and minimize however well we can do The other reason, or the other part of that is as sort of a fundamental mission as the, the head of AI to say, if we're going to surpass established radar companies that have dozens and dozens of engineers and have been working for decades on this, we're not going to do it by setting our windows or our thresholds a little bit different. We're going to use it by really making as close to an end-to-end -end machine learning system as possible. And that's the way that a small team can meet these establishment I mean, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so so right now, I mean, because we have the luxury of, you know, we're doing this inference on a, a GPU on a standalone machine. Um, I imagine once we compress this to an edge processor, there will be hard limits on the number of detections. 
Um, right now, basically, the the only upper bound on the number of protections that you can have have to do with how close the objects can be to each other. That makes it that. Um, it doesn't take very much computational power to, to track these things if you're doing it on a, on a QC. Um, so there's not a, a hard upper limit on that right now. Yeah, so the different classifications, we focus on um, static objects, pedestrian, cyclists, and cars. Um, so we selected those because we expected them to have distinct Microsoft Word signatures. Um, the pedestrian and car, because I think that's the sort of most non-trivial distinction. Um, and it is able to distinguish between those, although the biggest challenge there is getting a large enough uh, bicyclist data set. Finding enough cyclists, basically. You don't stop them. Yeah. Well, and actually, I mean, we're, it's, it's relatively rich, but the, the, the data imbalance gets crazy. I mean, you know, we're collecting in Southern California, and you know, you'll see 100 cars for every cyclist. you try to slam localization into your radar? Yeah, so, so we actually do, um, so it's, uh, well, sorry, let, let me back up. I, I, I missed the last part with the radar. Um, that is something that's, that's in our roadmap, um, but it's, I think it's, it's pretty challenging right now, um, you know, because we're, the, the hardware that we have is, is as much doing only inputs. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just so a When you get to the 2D arrays. Exactly. You can, if you're, if you're not concerned with doing it in real time, you can use things like uh, synthetic aperture radar, where you can generate these amazing high resolution images. Um, it's not it's not appropriate for, for real time because it doesn't work well for moving objects and it takes a lot of post processing to do it. But if you if you did a synthetic aperture radar map, you could localize it. Yeah, so it wouldn't matter. Mm, maybe. Yeah. There is actually a company um, that. Uh, another radar company that does uh, subterranean mapping and uses that for oh, yeah. SLAM. Yeah. They're, they're in like 200 mega, like the UHF band. Um, and they claim that you can drive around with their thing sort of facing at the ground. And if you, you drive it once, they'll tr construct the map, and you drive it again, then they can localize you better than GPS. So, um, do, you, do you have to remember the name of that company? Yeah. Wait, Wait, yeah. 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 Not a competitor of ours, so I can recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the the CES demo that you saw there had a pretty low frame rate. I mean, it was something like 20 frames per second. Um, for the the one that we have upcoming, we expect the frame rate on the order of like uh, maybe 100 or 200 frames per second for for uh, map 20. You mean with each frame? Which each do you identify uh, the definition of velocity in one frame? Or yes. Yeah, exactly. Because if you you know you saw the the, sort of the range Doppler representation, so if you see something, um, if you know anything about it, you know its range and velocity. That's, that's where it is. So that's that's one of the big strengths. Um, so you can get to even higher refresh rates if you do um, the time of flight or pulse radar, but you you give up a lot of that velocity. Right. <laughs> yeah. Defense? Um, no, because. Uh, we don't want to run afoul of ISAR. Basically, we want to be able to sell this this radar to car companies all over the world, and so um, we don't want it to be a defense product. We don't want to be associated with the military. Hmm. The military does have analog phase array radars, and they work really well, and they cost just about ten million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was sort of the, the genesis for this this idea. Of how can we take that level of performance and bring it to a consumer market? Was, was that what's came first and then the 5G was an outgrowth, or were those confused? I would say, yeah, basically from the founding of the company, AI, 5G, and um, automotive radar were the fundamental applications. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so we, of course, adapt. Um, so it, it turns out, you know, initially the thought was that this, um, the Sabre, you know, the sort of base station that could track trains and things, that would be the big product. Mm -hmm. um, we now think that the reflector rays are, are probably the, the better market because we can but we've already tested and deployed those. The, the market is ready for them, and the, the potential gain on that is, is huge. Mm -hmm. um. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Danny, how would you handle it? Mm -hmm. um, one, I think the guy is a guy gets in Portland, he gets in a fight. So he <laughs> <laughs> As an Oregonian, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. You know it. Um, two, uh, so looking at your one of your previous slides where you had a lot of OEMs uh, on that slide, Replace LiDAR for radar, and what's that 
Yeah. Yeah, but I think the, the short term play is to say we can uh, we can replace your radar and we can add all of these advanced capabilities. Um, so there aren't very many mass produced vehicles today that are shipping with LIDAR. I mean, it's like a, there's a, you get an Audi A7 and has this sort of LIDAR for traffic jam pilot. But in, in a real sense, you know, high performance LIDAR, there, there aren't any, and it's just because of the, the cost and the reliability. Um, so, you know, one big advantage of this is it's all conventional materials. Um, you know, we're partnering with a tier one, we think we can get unit cost down below $500 in mass production. And so that's, <coughs> that's, I think, the path to entry is to say, rather than just having adaptive cruise control, Imagine if you have adaptive cruise control and you can see pedestrian you got to under the you know, and give it a little heads up or an indication. Um, or even at a basic level, just to say an adaptive cruise control that, that functions more smoothly. If you can steer an elevation, you can distinguish between like an overhead sign and a car stopped in your lane, which today's cruise control can't. Um, there's been a couple of uh, high profile Tesla crashes where people have been autopilot. Um, there was one actually here in Sunnyvale where it was a, a stopped fire truck. If you want to come up with a hyperbolic example of something that could be plainly visible to both cameras and radars, that's the one. Um, but the camera was, they say, blinded by the sun, and the radar didn't see it because the driver was, he was going at about 50 miles an hour, and so it ignores things which are stopped relative to the road next. Because if it slammed on the brakes for those, it would slam on the brakes for signs and things like that. So having this high resolution allows you to have a much safer adaptive cruise control and enable things like slow before driving for like dense traffic jams, that sort of thing. Um, like I said before, I think I think there are things that LiDAR is always going to do better, and so I, I, I don't want to be up here saying we're going to beat them at everything, um, but I think for mass-produced autonomous driving. Well, I think you just replace all those active radar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'd be happy with that. I think as the price of, of LiDAR comes down with the solid state and then mm -hmm. a few hundred dollars, then we use both. Yeah, sure. And then, yeah, and yeah, yeah. No, I think I think it's you know there there are some technologies like like a camera. I don't see any reason not to have a camera in basically mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. application. Mm -hmm. all, all three, I should say. But yeah, no, well, I guess what I mean is that yeah, if lidar becomes cheaper, then they they complement each other. And it's not yeah, a, your camera yeah. lidar radar. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, as as a rule of thumb, you know, you can think. Um, you tend to worry about objects which are on the order of the wavelengths that you're using to, to image them. And so for small snowflakes, you know, you get a little bit of an attenuation, things look a bit dimmer. If you've got really large snowflakes or like torrential rain, um, then you can start to have more effects. But again, those are going to